Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. Well, Rachel, we are just a few days following uh, an election that I have, in my 68 years, never seen anything quite like that. And we're still in it. And so as a listener, you may have more information about the process of what occurred uh, than we have as we're doing this podcast. So we want to acknowledge we're, we're in Thursday uh, after the election on Tuesday, and this will likely uh, be broadcast uh, in this following weekend. So we will have more to say than what we have at the moment. But what we want to do is to reflect as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ on one of the most contentious, uh, divisive, in some sense cruel processes, uh, at least I've ever seen in the political realm. And the implications for what it means to live faithfully in the context of being bound not to the Republican or to the Democratic Party or any other earthly institution, but what it means to live out the calling that we have as members of the kingdom of God. So, Rachel, before we begin, just your, your initial gainsay about what you observe, particularly given that you live in one of the key states, uh, the one that I was educated in in seminary, the lovely state of Pennsylvania and particularly Philadelphia. Yeah, Um I mean, I, I've never been one to mince words or to lie about my humanity. So I will just own, I feel a lot of despair right now. And, you know, being in Pennsylvania, this is my first time living in a swing state. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma, which I mean, has always voted red. I lived in Washington for 14 years, which at least in my 14 years, always voted blue. So not that it didn't feel like my vote mattered. It did. I've always voted. I've always taken that very seriously. Um, but I've never had the experience that I've had in Pennsylvania. And I mean, really, truly, like the amount of information that changed in the weeks leading up, um, primarily as the Republican Party in Pennsylvania kept taking things to the Supreme Court to try to change deadlines and when votes could be counted. And um and what were the deadlines for mail-in ballots? And what I, you know, I live in a city that did a really good job of trying to create alternatives for people to be able to do mail-in voting early, but also know and trust that their ballots were being received, that they were doing it correctly. So I actually voted in a voting center early. Um, I stood in line with 85-year-olds um, who were standing in line for three, four hours um, so that they could make sure and they were doing things correctly. My vote was uh, received by the city, by the county on October 21st. Um, but because of the rules that kept changing, um, votes that were received before election day, which was about 2.5 million votes, could not be counted until 7 a.m. on election day. And there were many counties who decided they weren't even going to start counting mail-in ballots, which again, many of those mail-in ballots were actually returned in person. Um, could not start counting until after they were not going to start counting until after 8 PM on election day. And so that's part of what's playing out right now is votes that were received prior to the election are just now being counted. Um, and I know there's a lot of disinformation out there, um, which to me is where I feel so much despair um, because it just continues the, the amount of confusion and I would say outright lying about what's happening. Um, and so I come to this feeling, um, watching the election results come in, uh, I have to confess, I probably again, I mean, I wasn't as shocked as I was in 2016. Um, but I think some of my 
my hope that there would be some shifting in where people are willing to take a stand um, against what I would say feels like a lot of wickedness. And I know we're divided enough that like people might perceive, well, you're on one side and I'm on the other side and I feel the same way about your side. And there's something for me about this incapacity to actually um, want and have nuanced conversations and have conversations that take into account humanity. Um, and two, that there is a perception that there's like two equal sides that are basically on the same ground, just have different beliefs. There's something there that feels pretty despairing to me. Um, so we wait in Pennsylvania to see if our votes will be counted um, or what will happen. Well, and you put words to me prior to what it what what the process was uh, the claim that these these ballots are sort of like just being thrown into a pile and that the implication is that there are hundreds of thousands of illegitimate votes being thrown in how how did how did you get treated in the process of putting your vote in what happened Oh my gosh. Well, I told you I stood in line for three hours. I had to fill out a mail-in ballot request form. Once I got inside, which because of COVID, they were only letting like four people inside at a time. I sat with someone at a computer um, behind a screen who took my mail-in ballot form, printed out a ballot for me based on my request right there as I was sitting there. I took that ballot into a private room. I voted. I put it in the naked envelope. I put that naked envelope in the ballot. I signed it. And then I had to take it and turn it into the person with the lockbox where there was also a police officer standing next to the person with the lockbox. And again, I, I voted on October 19th and my ballot was received by the county, which, you know, you can always check where your ballot is when you do early voting. My ballot was received by the county, Philadelphia County on October 21st. It sounds wanton to me. I mean, there weren't two policemen there, were there? No, uh, just one. Oh. All right. So again, <laughs> also, it, it, you know, Philadelphia is live streaming their ballot counting. You can see, um, you can see their ballot counting process online. You can live stream it right now, and they're still counting. Uh, uh, there are three words I want to address through this process. Uh, we are living in a culture that has normalized and eroticized belligerence. We are aroused. I mean, there is not just passion. There is a sense of deep pleasure in the belligerence between, we'll just call it, the, the camp of the, uh, of the Biden and the camp of the Trump. So right there, we've got a huge issue. We're not talking about different opponents, you know, a division of perspectives. We're talking about seeing one another as enemies. And then uh, a second category I want to come to is that we're living currently in a world of such dis disinformation, such, uh, I, I don't know how to call it beyond bizarre, crazy, cray-cray conspiracy theories that's adding paranoia to the belligerence. And when you've got, in one sense, hate, hate filled paranoia, then what you have is almost the inevitability of a kind of divide that justifies almost any level of violence against the other side because you're destroying something that's evil from your perspective. You're actually doing good for the universe by killing in some form. And uh, I think that opens up uh, a conversation, especially given your time in Rwanda. So that that's the trajectory. As we go through this, but let's just start with the reality. There is hate-filled passion, passion-filled hate uh, that, as you put it so well, leaves no room for conversation, for nuance, uh, for holding one another's perspective, at least with honor versus antipathy. And that's going to lead 
almost always to a kind of eroticization of rage, where we feel alive uh, with rage, filled then with contempt. Uh, Again, as you hear me put words to that, what has been your experience being in the middle or, or, or on in conversations? Yeah, I mean, Dan, that is, uh, I mean, if you could hear the conversations I've had with my husband, <laughs> like the agonizing conversations at this intersection, because it feels like, I mean, I work in trauma. I know, I know what trauma manifested, like the impact of trauma looks like, and people are afraid. Whether those, I mean, fight, flight, or freeze, like the fight that we're in right now tells me like the fact that that many people chose Donald Trump again, despite the fact that he literally is the manifestation, everything he represents is completely opposite of everything I was raised to believe would be true about someone with good character. The way he talks, the way he treats people, the way he mocks, the way he vilifies, the way he lies. Um, his bravado, um, just again, that tells me people are really afraid. And, and I know that belligerence, that judgment, that shame only intensifies fear. Now, I do not think the fear on like both sides is actually equal or justified in reality. That doesn't make it any less real. And so, and it is where I would say like, there are certain friends I have that I'm like, you don't have to get in these trenches um, with the people I might need to get in some of the trenches with, I can provide some relief from some of these spaces that actually traumatize you and trigger you. But I, I, I feel the sense of, I mean, dehumanizing other people, making them less human, seeing something less of their face, no matter how we're doing it, it makes it so much easier to again, defend ourselves against them. Um, it makes us feel safer momentarily. Um, but it's not actually going to lead to the kind of change that we want. Because when you say, what does it look like to, um, manifest the kingdom of God here and now we don't just sit around and wait for like all to be well someday down the road. Part of what it means to be the bride of Christ is to be the people who are pulling the future into the present who are joining the spirit to say liberation is for people now, and it will not be found in the structures of this world. The tools of empire will never be the tools for the kingdom of God. And I think that's where we find ourselves in the United States is, is there are many people, myself included, because this election has continued to reveal to me that I want to put my hope in democracy in a way that doesn't require me to live with with the faith and hope and love of the kingdom of God. And there could be a way around it. (laughs) Like if there could be a way around having to give up my life in that way, I want to find it. Well, you said it earlier and I'm going to repeat it, but I also want to say you're the one who put words to it, that politics have become not just a civil religion, but in many ways, the embodiment of what I see, at least in many of my evangelical friends, the very embodiment of what it means to be a faithful Christian. And you go, wait a minute, uh, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We don't actually have a resource that is centralized uh, in a governmental process. We are servants not of the United States of America. We are servants of the kingdom of God. Yeah, well, this is this was what was so disturbing to me when Mike Pence said from a national stage, let us run with endurance, the race that is set before us. Let us fix our eyes on old glory. Um, I thought I would see so many more people kind of saying, okay, that... That's, Over the, that's line. the line, you know, like we get what you're saying, you know, I think to me that was a very revelatory moment because that is not what scripture says. It says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And, you know, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. That's that's the text. It's It's not a one that says, 
you know, grasp at your privileges at the expense of others, you know, for the sake of glory of your nation, which is one nation in an entire world of people who, um, many of whom don't actually, most believers of our modern time do not live in the United States of America. Like the majority of Christ followers in the globe are not found in the U S. And so I, yeah. Okay. I digress. I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting a little preachy, which I don't, preach it, I, preach I, it, girl. I will not apologize for, but again, is telling me that people actually find more, um, pe- like more, we're turning is Christian. And I'm speaking primarily about Christians turning to, and, and, you know, Christians who mo- mostly identify as white, because there are a lot of faith that Christian expressions in other communities that have been living in the shadow of empire for a long time. And in some ways I'm like, Oh man, I just need to be discipled by you because I don't have the kind of resilience I want to have. I will look at this, the log in my own eye, um, the places I, again, I'm not talking about something, the, a kind of idolatry that I just think people who love Donald Trump have. I'm talking about an idolatry I find in myself and, and, um, like, and we're still meant to create systems um, in flesh and blood with an insight that powers and principalities are actually what we're up against. Sure. On earth as it is in heaven. And I go back to your phrase, look, belligerence is going to be justified and in many ways eroticized if we don't address what's the fear in all sides. And we don't address fear by shouting at somebody. We don't address fear, even when it's uh, partially legitimate or totally illegitimate, by in many ways dehumanizing them in order to in many ways extract them from a view into our view. So uh, it's at least one basic issue of we're asking of you, listener, to forsake belligerence and begin to address what fear is there in you and what fear is in the world that you have care and contact with. And then as we build this to say, look, when you add paranoia to belligerence, uh, to a point of being able to uh, attack election results because, well, uh, you didn't uh, put the right ballot in at the right time. And obviously, Rachel, you were cheating when you put your ballot in. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. But I, I, I personally, I, I don't know if there is a conspiracy theory that troubles me more. And how do you actually... Uh, even get stratification of of it. But the QAnon uh, madness, craziness, the fact that one report said 40-some percent of Republicans actually think it is likely true that there is a Q uh, and where one goes, we all go. Uh, And with that, uh, there are pedophiles at the highest levels of our elite society uh, who are also cannibals. And you go, oh, there are dark things going on all over the world in the Democratic and Republican parties uh, and every other. I'm not denying that there is wickedness in high places, but unsubstantiated, even to a point of FBI disclosed uh, that it is indeed not only not true, but harmful. And you go, what world are we living in that there is any place for this level of deceit, of lies, of violation of the Ninth Commandment, even to a point where conspiracy theories began Donald Trump's history against Obama. And you go, as if you think it's a personality issue. Well, I like his policies, but not his personality. And you go, this man has been perpetuating conspiracy theories and fear-mongering as the means by which to control the narrative and to say, look, this doesn't require that you be ashamed of voting for Trump. This is asking, will you continue to join 
narratives designed to create terror and therefore open up the potential of a type of totalitarian control. It's dark. Yeah, well, and I think that that's, I mean, there are a lot of things, I think I've made it clear, like a lot of things I do not like about Donald Trump. One of the things I feel the most fierce about is the way in which he exploits fear and invites people to the worst parts of themselves um, because of fear, um, the way he use, uses it as a weapon uh, of control. And I wrote about this in 2015 on the Allender Center blog during Advent, um, during the primaries in 2015. I actually went back and found a blog post where I was writing about what it means to be children of God who are no longer slaves to fear, um, who are filled with the spirit and and where are we actually putting our hope? And, you know, I think that that is one of the things that's so disheartening for the people saying, we need you to see there are systems at play, powers and principalities of systemic racism, of, you know, economic injustice, when they see someone not being able to see that and saying, that's a lie, you know, you're lying about our story, because we don't really have a common story anymore, but can go down the QAnon pathway and believe all these things and see all these things that actually haven't been made explicit. (laughs) And so I, oh, it just, it breaks my heart. And when we know like that power of fear and dehumanization, how many times we have to see it play out in history? Like it's so dangerous. It leads to genocide. It leads to annihilation of entire peoples. Like if we think for one second in the United States that we are somehow above this human story of letting fear fester in us in a way that the only way we can restore any sense of peace is to annihilate the other. If we think that we're somehow so civilized, so Christian that we are above that, we do not know our story. We do not know the human story. And that's why I feel despair because I feel like I am in the midst of craziness where people do not want to see the story that we left to our own devices are incredibly cruel when we let fear rule the day, when we partner that with paranoia, when we think belligerence and hatred is the only way to stay safe, when we try to preserve our life based on lies and fear, we will turn to annihilation. And we have so many people who have generously shared their stories of this playing out to say, don't go down this road. And you've got watchdogs all around the world saying the United States is ripe for this kind of conflict. We already have a civil war in our story. And I just, to me, this is where I just go, I don't know, I don't know the way through. We already have genocide as a part of our story in this nation, and that is some of the healing that needs to actually be engaged in our bodies, in our families, in our communities. We don't know our story. Well, uh, uh, all I can say is you're really, let's just get it back up on the surface. You're talking about your experience uh, having been in Rwanda. Um, And the arrogance to presume that we might not be in uh, Germany, 1934, Uh, the idea that it could never happen here. Well, the cry of never forget is it can happen anywhere, including what happened in supposedly the most civilized industrialized and philosophically, theologically sophisticated world, Germany. But we just have to have the humility to say we are talking about big things here. In one sense, bigger than the election, (laughs) bigger than Trump-Biden. We're talking about the story of evil in its intent to divide and to create division through this belligerence and paranoia that leads to dehumanization. So what we're asking for you to consider is how do you, irrespective of who you voted for, because at one level, I say it matters. Another level, I don't think it matters because we need to create a communion 
a conversation of honoring fear and engaging it in the nuance of the larger story of the gospel, rather than being bound in the civil religion, assuming that our governmental structures are actually part of and will save us. If that's true, then it's more than just being a bridge builder. It's actually being a prophetic presence to say, to hell with belligerence and to hell with all forms of paranoia, can we care for whatever it is, is evoking your very, very deep, almost erotic passion for one candidate or one perspective versus another. Otherwise, uh, I think we are not far and again, maybe not far, maybe a year, five, 10, 20, from a level where the division and polarization really sets up armed resistance against the enemy that you perceive to be evil. So your despair feels honorable, uh, uh, but I, I would say it's despair that needs to lead to a kind of intentionality of, I will not participate in left-oriented contempt for the right. I will not stand with right-oriented contempt for the left. Uh, I, I may hold positions, but I will not participate in a kind of belligerence that dehumanizes anyone on any side, even with people I deeply believe are wrong. Yes. As long as you, I want to just nuance, as long as you and I and everyone listening understands that anger and lament are different than belligerence and the people who are crying out, because we're also talking about bodies and we cannot do this work without getting in our bodies. And there are people in their bodies in this world who do not feel safe and who feel agony and who actually feel like ideas are a privilege. And like, you know, we're not just going to get in an ideological debate when my body is on the line. And again, I actually think there's places all around where that needs to be engaged. So I just want to make sure we note, like I, I believe I will stand and defend anyone I feel needs protection. I can do that and still see your face and still want the same rescue for you. You know, in these past few days, I've been really convicted that I have not prayed for healing for people I perceive as my enemy and the enemy of those I love because of their ideals, because of their ideology, and because of their paranoia, to be honest with you. The sense of like, I feel like you've got a, you know, machine gun strapped around your chest and you're coming for my people because you have been listening to these conspiracy theories and I will, I will protect my people and I'm a fighter. So of course I'm going to want to fight, but I, I have just been realizing like, I truly believe it's going to take a movement of Jesus to get into hearts. And, and there has to be people doing their part in every facet, but what is stopping me from even just the prayers for healing? Um, for for Jesus to break through, why does it still feel safer to perceive the other as an enemy that needs to be eradicated, even in my prayer life, even in my sense of, I don't know how to pray for your healing, um, because I it's it's almost too painful to hope for that, because um, it's so personal, right? It's, I'm not talking about just like people out there. I'm talking about people I know and love um, dearly, and so I just wanted to make sure we we nuance that sense of like belligerence and dehumanization is distinctly different from a kind of anger and crying out to God and crying out for justice and crying out for mercy. Um, well, because I, it, I, I think people need to hear that, right? Oh, I, I agree. And, uh, but I want you to nuance my nuance of your nuance. <laughs> nuance, I nuance of your nuance. Okay, let's do and, it. And, and <laughs> when you have lament, anger is not rage. When you've got lament, it is the it is the grief filled longing for restoration of all things to be as they're meant to be. But when there is rage, anger, without grief, lament, 
then there is no humanity present. There's just rage and belligerence. So I, I couldn't agree with you more. When I'm engaging, and I, I feel like I have the privilege of having so many friends who voted for both the Bidens uh, and the Trumps. And what I've discovered with a number uh, is a, a level of contempt at the beginning. And when it gets named, like, you hate these people, you want them destroyed. It's like, no, I'm talking my friends. Uh, I, I get this. No, I don't. And it's like, well, why do you sound like it? Why is there just this animus that I go back to this word as you are aroused? I mean, you feel alive in your rage. Where's the grief on your and their behalf? Where is the heart to pray on their behalf? Um, and that's what I feel like we have lost. We don't have the ability to bridge because we have not owned the presence of grief and anger together in a way that allows people to see both our very tender, but our also very ferocious kindness. So it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance. We will not see this nation uh, or the particularity of our neighborhoods or our families bring any form of healing and conversation that actually furthers uh, our movement uh, of, of the kingdom of God if we don't enter this with something very different than what has been presented uh, as apparently the options uh, being you know, taught in our churches and uh, in our world. So uh, as we come uh, to an end, I, I just want to add that I, I see this as uh, the potential uh, for Biden to win. Uh, and as Trump departs, what I fear uh, is something I've seen uh, so often I could scream, and that is narcissists uh, who end up losing their marriages, uh, end up creating a kind of, I will burn the house down. I will, I don't even care what it does to me. And I have seen violence. Uh, I have seen literal homes burned because of a commitment to ruin once the shame uh, has become more, shall we say, permanent for that person and being caught. And as a believer, uh, you need to stand against domestic violence, uh, whether it's in an individual home near you uh, or whether it's the president you supported, but who is going to ravage uh, uh, this country uh, in his departure. Uh, we need to stand against all forms of violence that open the door to, again, as you put it so well, a kind of Rwandan or a kind of Germany, destruction of people groups, destructions of individual lives. Any last thoughts, Rachel? Well, I think we're going to need to come back and a, a, a address a little bit more some of these issues as we begin to think about how the kingdom of God is meant to rule our lives to take us deeper into false narratives in order to come back to the point. People are ruled by stories. You and I need to be ruled by the kingdom of God, not QAnon, uh, not the Trump narrative, not the Biden narrative. Uh, the Kingdom of God narrative. The Allender Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. 